With great power comes great responsibility. Compromise where you can. Where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right, even if the whole world is telling you to move, it is your duty to plant yourself like a tree, look them in the eye and say no, you move. Never step onto the battlefield of ideas unprepared. Before you enter the fray, you need a plan. And there's no better place to get one than right here on Tactics with host Caleb Colquitt. The Situation Room goes live now on News Radio 1440. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Tactics, where speech isn't violence, tolerance isn't love, and disagreement isn't hate. I'm Caleb Colquitt, as always, and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to spend some time with us, and we always appreciate the audience doing that. So for those of you who may not have been here for my last episode, this is going to be my last series of episodes. I'm doing it just a few more episodes. This is going to be the next to last one. And after that, I'm done with the regular episodes and I will put out some content every now and then, but it's not going to be a regular episode. Just got too much on my plate and with the new job really wasn't able to continue to do this. So I know very sad, but when I was thinking about what I needed to do for my last series of episodes, I thought what I really need to do is do something that lasts, something that's going to take some time. And so instead of doing news stories like we normally do, I'm going to be doing something that really focuses on the worldview. And I felt that the best way to do this was to rebut three of the biggest lies told by the left. And so instead of teaching you how to defeat the arguments that pop up on a weekly basis, these videos will be a reference that you can go back to and defeat the arguments at the fundamental level. And the reason that that's really important is because a lot of the arguments that they're making are based off some of these lies. And so if you can debate the lie at the core of whatever it is that they're trying to convince you of, you can understand how to rebut the, the higher level of the argument, the, uh, the manifestation of this underlying belief that you have. And so that's really where we want to start out tonight. We're going to start out with lie number two. You might remember, uh, just to give a quick recap, that lie number one was all about that man is basically good and he can be perfected. And if you know, it was all about a uh, man really being a good being and at the core people are really good and it's just society and the systems and all these other things that make them corrupt and then we showed both from a biblical and a constitutional perspective that's actually not true in fact mankind is not good they are flawed and because of that there are systems that, that can be put in place but all systems are going to be inherently corrupt because humans are inherently corrupt so that was the first slide that we went over and i do recommend that you go back and watch that if you would like to get a better uh, view and a better platform to jump off on the second one, because some of the things we're gonna be talking about with line number two do build off of that slightly. You don't necessarily have to watch it or have to have seen it to get this one, but I do recommend having watched that one first, if possible, just to get the maximum amount of good out of this one. But it, you know, regardless, the second lie in the series that we're going to be covering tonight is that the needs of the collective outweigh the needs of the individual. Now, a lot of people do genuinely believe this, and some of these lies have invaded even places like the church and personal life. Uh, so I do want to go ahead, and you might remember from the last episode that I did this in my introduction, that I'm going to explain the lie itself, where it comes from, how it operates, how it manifests itself on the left, and then I'm going to talk about the biblical rebuttal and the constitutional rebuttal. So we're going to get into all of that right now. The needs of the collective outweighing the needs of the individual. On its surface, sounds like something that's good. It sounds like something that's attractive, and that's why so many people fall for it. So explaining the theology of the pseudo-religion of leftism and this lie, which is at its core, this one is really derivative of the man is basically good. Because if you see man as being basically good, and it's really the systems that are corrupt, well, then the needs of the individual, those really pale in comparison to the needs of the collective. And if you are a utopianist, which is, again, an outcropping of the idea that man is basically good and can be perfected, that's the perfected part. If you believe that a utopia can be created outside of Eden, and that's really what you're striving for, instead of personal spiritual well-being and having a relationship with Christ, which allows you to go to heaven, 
this is where that lie really starts to sink its teeth in, is lie number two. Because then if you understand and you believe erroneously that man is basically good and can be perfected, well, then really any sacrifice would make sense if the outcome, if the goal is some kind of utopia. And so because of that, they're willing to sacrifice some of the needs of the individual because they believe that the needs of the collective simply outweigh them. And uh, if you do believe those things, then you believe that once you've corrected the system, because the system is what makes people corrupt, remember, then everything else falls into place. You've created a perfect world. Congratulations. And all of the sacrifices that you made to get there, even if it meant some individuals had to lose their freedoms, their liberties, even their lives, well, really, it was all worth it. And that's really where this lie kind of comes from, is it's derivative of the first lie that we were talking about. Now, I do want to, before we dive any deeper, make a quick clarification, because I can already see some you know, well-intended Christians and, and people that are theologians saying, well, now, wait a second. Doesn't the Bible kind of teach that the needs of the collective are better than the needs of the individual? It actually doesn't, and I'm going to dive into that more when I get to the biblical rebuttal. But I do want to, even before that, make a clear distinction between what we're talking about here. Because there are times, as a person, that you can, of your own free will and accord, the morally correct decision to make would be the one that sacrifices the thing that you want for the betterment of other people or even a group. For example, when people were giving money to the church because there was a need to provide for the poor and needy, that is you as an individual saying, I will give up some of the things that I have of my own volition in order to help those out there uh, so that we can, you know, it helps with the group cohesion, it helps with their own individual needs, and it's going to help build the church overall, not just in the sense that it's going to increase our numbers, but it's also going to increase the spiritual well-being of the members there. And on the personal level, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I've engaged in that quite a bit in my lifetime. And, and a lot of the decisions that I have made, I wouldn't say all of them because I, you know, <laughs> I'm not hiding the ball here. Uh, I, I'm not the most selfless person in the world. I, I wish that I were and I'm working towards that. But um, I would like to be able to sit here and say that I make all of my decisions based on what's going to be best for God and for other people, because that's one of the greatest commands. Love, love God and then love your neighbor as yourself. I understand that. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the lie that the needs of the collective outweighs the needs of the individual. In other words, individual needs are irrelevant when stacked up against collective needs. The Bible never teaches that. In fact, a lot of the things that we're talking about, about building the church and, and building the spiritual community, that is done specifically so that the individuals will be able to strengthen their relationship with Christ. And so there is a distinction in something that is voluntary, something that the person in and of themselves decides that they are willing to forego to help another person. That's very different than a top-down system that says, whatever is best for the collective, that is what we must do. And if the individuals don't like it tough, we're creating a system centered around the needs of the collective. Those are two very, very, very different things. And we'll explain some of those nuances a little bit later when we get into the biblical argument. But right now and, and where we are, talking about the origins of this, really all forms of collectivism start with this lie. All of them. They have to because they can't justify some of the things that they will advocate doing to individuals if they don't. And that takes the form of Marxism, fascism, socialism, communism, authoritarianism, racism, any of the isms, white supremacy, all of them start with the idea that the collective need outweighs what has to happen to individuals. And really, it kind of like the last slide where we we're talking about there's some Greek philosophy at the core of this that has been corrupted. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of a lot of the Greek philosophy. I don't think they got everything perfect, but, you know, it moved the ball pretty far down the field. This actually does start with one of Plato's ideas. Plato believed in the idea of the philosopher king. So essentially, we would find the smartest among us, one of the most intelligent individuals among us, and that we would basically make him king and give him all authority so that he could see over the needs of the society. The problem with that is that assumes 
that the needs of the society are going to be more important than the needs of the individual. I really like Plato. He's one of the greatest thinkers in all of human history, but this is a, a part where he got it wrong. And by the way, the system that he recommended to essentially get a philosopher king, that he was going to separate them from a family and separate them from society and have a group of young boys raised in a particular way and have whichever one is, is the smartest and wins out among them to be appointed king at a certain age. That's a really, really horrible idea, so much so that it was adopted by Adolf Hitler. So, you know, Plato, great philosopher that had amazing contributions to the philosophical community. This is one where it was a really big swing and a miss. So, you know, not even Plato can get everything right. Um, but that was his idea, primarily, ironically, as a counter to democracy. And if you understand Plato's history, you understand why he hated democracy. And by the way, I think he was right in hating democracy. I thought that his, his replacement for it sucked, but I understand why he hated democracy. It killed his teacher. Socrates was betrayed by democracy, and even though he didn't do anything wrong, by majority vote, majority rule, by democracy, he was executed. Plato didn't like this, and he thought that the majority was foolish in doing so, and he was right. The problem is what he came up with to replace it is, I think, even worse than democracy would be, even though I don't think that there's really much difference in having an all-powerful uh, monarch at the top and having a bunch of monarchs deciding everything. I, I don't think that a whole bunch of monarchs deciding something is better than one monarch doing it necessarily. I mean, if I had to pick between the two, I'd probably pick democracy. But to be perfectly frank, I mean, one can be just as oppressive and brutal as the other. So I'm not sure that you're really winning out on that one either way. Um, but the thing is, and, and this is the irony, democracy also starts with this false premise. And so both Plato's idea of having the philosopher king and having the, the brightest among us sort of centrally plan everything and democracy, which states that humans are basically good and the needs of the collective outweigh the needs of the individual. Therefore, if the majority deems that the needs of the individual are less important than the needs of the majority, well, then we have to go with the majority. Both of those erroneous fields of, of thinking, both of those erroneous forms of government are both centered around the idea that the need of the collective is more important than the needs of the individual. And this takes so many different forms. Almost every single major idea on the Democrat side has its origin somewhere in this lie. For example, abortion. One of the reasons that people support abortion is population control. People on the left talk about this all the time. We, we need to control the population, the needs of the population. It, look, if that means you don't get a kid, that's just, you know, that's tough squash for you. That's how China sees it. They thought that it's funny that they're actually now reversing that in China. Uh, but for decades, China was like, the population's too big. We can't sustain it. It's too many mouths to feed. Therefore, we're just going to have to abort some kids whether you like it or not. Now, in America, they do at, le at least give the parents, in most cases, the decision on that. But either way, the idea that abortion is a moral good because it tamps down the population, that is ultimately an idea that if we have to sacrifice this one individual in the womb, or several thousand individuals of the room, uh, in the womb, or several million or 63 million people in the womb to keep the population down because that's going to benefit society as a whole, well then really... That's what we need. If, if you've seen Marvel's Endgame and Infinity War, this is essentially the argument Thanos makes. Yeah, I'm going to wipe out half the people in the universe, but, you know, considering how much better the universe will be once they're gone, you know, it, it'll be better for the collective. The collective's needs are more important than those individuals' needs. That was the argument that he made. And, you know, I could go through hundreds of different bad guy scenarios from fiction to sort of hash that out, but that's the same thing. And we see this take different forms all the time. Global warming is the same way. Look, if, if you have to ride around in an electric car or your house gets cold and there's just nothing to heat it with because wind and solar are not reliable, that's just a sacrifice you're going to have to make because it's better for the collective if the globe doesn't warm up 
0.4 degrees Celsius in the next hundred years. Not saying it makes sense, just saying that this is the, the lies how they convince themselves that it's okay. Gun control is the same way. Look, we know that there's going to be some people that die or get raped or you know, any other number of unscrupulous activities happening towards them because they do not have access to a firearm. Well, you know, that's just the sacrifice you're going to have to make because we have to get rid of guns to get rid of the gun problem. So that's just, you know, collateral damage on our part. Lockdowns, mass mandates, vac uh, vaccine mandates. Does any of this ring a bell? That's all that is. Well, we really need to figure out a way to get rid of the virus, and that's really going to be better for the collective as a whole. So we're going to have to just mandate vaccines. Doesn't matter that it's against your religion. Doesn't matter it's something that you may not want to do because you have a medical history where you, this literally happened where a woman had her kids taken away from her because she didn't want to take a vaccine because she's had a bad reactions to vaccines in the past. No evidence that this one was going to be the same way, but she decided it wasn't worth the risk since she was young anyway. And this is what happened is that uh, the judge actually revoked custody of her kid. Well, you know, if that individual has to suffer so that we can shove down mask mandates and vaccine mandates, well, that's just the price you got to pay. If you have asthma and have a hard time breathing and a mask is very uncomfortable for you, well, I'm sorry, tough. That's what we have to do now. And that's why they loved this idea that, well, the mask isn't for you. It's, it's for other people. It's to protect others. And you have to wear it and you have to mandate it because it's not about you as an individual. It's not enough for you to risk your own life. We're fine with that. But the thing is, you would be risking the life of everybody around you. Now, that was always hogwash, but it was a lie that was very convenient for them to push it through and, and to push this idea of why it was essential. Um, lockdowns the same way. I won't go through everything on lockdowns, but I mean, it's obvious that the reason they're saying we got to keep you locked up, even though you're young and healthy and there's almost no chance you would die from this virus is because, well, the collective really needs you to do that, even whether it makes sense or not. Uh, this is really at the core of the complete live system by Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel. You may remember that Zeke Emanuel was one of the advisors on Obamacare when that legislation was being crafted. And one of the things that was very controversial that he had, had put out several papers on was known as the complete live system. It was basically a cradle to grave uh, formula to provide Medicare to people. And he said, really the people that are under about the age of 12, they're not of working age yet. And we've not put a whole lot of investment in them as far as the society goes. And so because of that, they get the least amount of care when we're rationing care. And by the way, people that are over the age of retirement really can't contribute much to society. And he, this is his, him saying it, not mine. You can look it up. Really at the point that they're over 70 years old, that's a person that they really don't have any quality of life left. And he's saying this even now that he's over 70. He's like, you know what? I've lived my life. I can die at any time and it's fine with me. Okay, well, that's fine for you. But what you're saying is through your system, that if you're over 70, you just don't get nice Medicare and we have to give you less resources because you're not contributing to society. Again, they're looking at it as you only have value through the value that you contribute to the collective. Your needs, your wants, your desires, your life as an individual is really insignificant because we're really concerned about the whole, not you as an individual. Uh, the fact that they are against school choice you know, I actually got into an argument with a caller one time on the radio when this happened to me. <clears throat> Had a call in and we were talking about school choice and, you know, the public system, the public school system in Montgomery is pretty bad. And she blamed all of this on white flight and that so many white people had moved out to Prattville and Millbrook and Wetumpka and Pike Road and all these other areas. And if they would just keep their kids in the system, then that would be better because that would mean that money would keep flowing in. I was like, well, now hang on. Are you telling me that you think that parents, knowing that the public school system in Montgomery is terrible, should put their kids back in that system so that they can get more money, which, you know, apparently she was thinking that throwing more money at the problem would fix it. That's never worked in Montgomery, but let's just pretend for the sake of argument that she was right on that. That for, you know, four years of high school, they should just completely waste their kids' education and have them the product of a terrible school system. Also, kids in the future can have a better education. That doesn't make any sense. That would be a bad parent that would do that. 
and I'm not a parent, don't have kids, but I feel pretty confident saying, you know what, I'm fine with it if my kid gets a crummy education as long as it benefits other kids in the future. That's not good. That is bad, bad parenting. But this is the suggestion that people on the left will often make, that uh, really the problem is if, if we had more people just doing this and avoiding white flight or, um, you know, just not having school choice and being forced into certain schools so that, that those tax dollars are forced to go there, well, then that's going to make a better system overall. And if you are not the beneficiary of it for whatever reason, whether it's the quality of education, whether it's the location of the school, uh, I remember that there was when I was at Marbury, just because that it happens to be very close to the county line, there was a girl who her entire family had worked at Marbury High School, her entire family for years. And she lived so close to school that she could have walked to Marbury. But because she was technically, her family's property was technically on the other side of the county line, she had to drive or she had to ride a bus for about 45 minutes every morning and 45 minutes back every day. And she was the last stop because of how far she, uh, far away she was from the Chilton County schools. It would have made far more sense if we just had school choice for her to go to the school that she could have literally walked to. But they didn't do that. And this is the problem. As long as the system they believe is going to be benefited, your individual sacrifices are really kind of a moot point for us. Uh, this is true of global citizenship. They'll say, they've been people proposing here recently, that there should be a global minimum wage and a global corporate tax. Now, how much sense does that make? I mean, think about it. If you are a person living in the third world, your minimum wage when the average person can live off of $1.25 a day in that country is going to be 15 American dollars, the same value as 15 American dollars in America. That's ridiculous, and it'll never work. Your economy couldn't handle that, but that's what they call for because really, whether it makes sense or not or how, how much harm is going to be done by it is immaterial as long as we feel good about our policy and it's benefiting the collective. The same thing with illegal immigration when it comes to, since we're talking about other countries, well, yeah, it's going to bankrupt certain communities near the border and it's really bad for crime and there's lots of drug smuggling. But the thing is, collectively, it's going to be better. Now, what they actually mean by that is collectively, they're going to get more votes. But what they say is collectively, illegal immigration is actually good. Then the diversity that we will experience from that is going to be good. So long term, we're okay with certain communities and certain people suffering, as long as in the end, it means we get a better collective outcome as far as that goes. And I don't even think I have to explain this one, but that's the whole idea behind redistribution of wealth. Yeah, it's bad for individuals and we're taking a lot of their money, even though they worked really hard for it, but that's really fine with us because that means as a collective, we have a better society. Now, obviously you can make the argument, and I have a thousand times that that's actually not true, but that is where the lie originates from, is from that idea of collectivism. Uh, there are some historic examples, of course, as well. And we could use a lot of the examples that we've used beforehand and apply them to past failed communist states. However, some of the older examples that we could look to, for example, would be like I was talking about school choice. They had forced busing at one time in this country even though it didn't make any sense, even though it was more expensive for school districts to do, and often it resulted in students going to schools they didn't want to go, they still were advocates of forced busing. Another one that is an oldie, remember back before the Civil War, most of the arguments that were pro-slavery arguments were, well, we kind of have to continue to have it because of the economy. The thing is, if you take away slavery, then you take away our labor force. If you take away our labor force, we can't produce cotton. And so we really need slavery because look at how much we're exporting from the South and how much money is drawn into America because of the cotton trade. And that would fall apart if slavery were abolished. Now, first of all, that's simply not true. Those people didn't vanish. And uh, even though I'm not saying that everything worked out perfectly post-slavery either, uh, when they were there, they still wound up working many times in the same places they did before. It's just now they actually had to get paid for it. So that was one thing that was a big difference. Uh, another lie that was a part of that is actually the South 
and America as a whole economically did much better when that happened, when they abolished slavery, because they had to start innovating. They had to build a society, and actually it turns out slavery was a drag on the economy when it was all said and done. Internment of Japanese Americans. Well, yeah, those uh, Japanese Americans who may have been out of Japan for several generations and we have no reason to believe are not loyal to the country. Well, they might be Japanese spies. So we got to round them all up and put them in camps. Well, that's bad for the families. Well, so what? They're individuals. This is better for the collective. See, all of these dumb arguments go back to that lie. The USSR taking over farms in the Holodomor. That was the thing that happened. And by the way, I'm terrified right now at what's going on in the Ukraine and Russia looking as though they plan on taking over because I'm afraid that they'll repeat the mistakes of the past. The reason that the USSR needed Ukraine in the first place back then is because Ukraine is the breadbasket. It is the place where the food is grown in that part of Europe. And they were already strapped for resources. They really needed Ukraine because they needed its resources, and so they took it over. And then they took all their food and then systematically and intentionally starved out millions of people specifically because they rebelled against the USSR when other countries did not. It wasn't just that they took the resources, because of course they did, but it was ultimately that they, even though they had more food than they pretended like they did, they intentionally wanted to starve out millions of people because it was a punishment. Because ultimately, they believed as a collective that was going to lead to better results. The Great Leap Forward is another example of this. Uh, they said, well, yeah, it's going to cause some Short-term sacrifices, but long-term gains. Now, it turns out the long-term gains, were, gains weren't there anyway, but even if they had been, it wasn't fair to starve out people so that you could get to your better society collectively. And really, white supremacy is the same way. Now, it's a very different version of that lie, but it's the same lie at the end because white supremacists or other nationalists or, white, or, or supremacy movements with other races, they all center around this idea that well, society will be better if this race of people or this group of people or this particular minority status. It can be the minority, too. That, that's also a thing that can happen. If these people had more power and these people were put in charge, that's going to be better for the collective, even if it means that other people have to have their rights trampled over in the short term. We're okay with doing that to individuals as long as we get a better collective outcome. All of this is a manufactured manifestation of old paganism. I know that's probably not where you thought that this was going to go, but really that's what it is. Paganism, tribalist tendencies from the ancient world, that's all they are. The idea was we all had to be part of the same religion, and we all had to worship the same idol or statue or whatever it was, because that was what was going to be best for the community. Well, we might have to sacrifice a virgin to the god, because that is what's best for the community. That will cause the rain to come, and thus the community will be better. And, you know, if you're the, the family that loses their virgin daughter, well, sucks to be you. Or if we have to sacrifice your children, your babies, to Molech, yeah, but it's going to create a much better harvest for everybody else. And so that's a sacrifice we're willing to make, even if it means that you lose your child as a result of it. That's how these people thought. And it's really no different than modern leftism. They have cloaked it in the veil of the science or a thousand other different labels. But it's the same premise, that it's okay to run roughshod over certain individuals as long as the collective needs have been served. And really, going back to abortion, this is why they're perfectly comfortable sacrificing some babies for the sake of the collective economic better outcomes, which is exactly what child sacrifice was in the ancient world. We'll sacrifice some babies, and then our economy will be better because we'll have a more bountiful harvest. The people on the left are now saying, we'll sacrifice some babies, that'll keep the population down, that'll leave these women free to do some work. These are the arguments that they're making right now. And because of that, the economy will be better and we'll have a better society because we don't have those dregs on society dragging us down. That's the argument that these people make. And this is also why people on the left need collective affirmation, because if you don't believe in God, if you believe that government is the ultimate power and society is the ultimate power and majority should rule, well, then really you need the consent of the government and the consent 
of society to give you some kind of affirmation that you're morally good. Because if you believe that they are the moral arbiters, well, then saying that something you believe in or something that you do is morally wrong is a big problem for them. There's a lot of gay people that don't care what God thinks of their decisions because they don't believe God exists. But they care very much about getting a marriage certificate from the government because that says that your relationship is okay in our book. Or that society saying, we affirm that this decision that you're making is all right. Now that's silly and childish. And it's the opposite of a God-centered worldview where really, if you are a person that believes in God, you don't care whether other people think you're right or not. Because if God thinks you're right, that's really all you need. You don't have a whole lot of desire to have other people constantly affirm that you're making the right decision. Because if you're on God's side, which is what Abraham Lincoln, for example, he, he espoused that kind of thinking. If you're on God's side and God is right, it doesn't matter if every other person on planet Earth thinks you're wrong. It's just really not important to you. But they need society to affirm their choices because if they don't, they feel like they might actually be morally wrong. If you believe that that is how morals are created, then that's why you fight so hard to get society to change their ideas about morality because you think once they, you know, 50% plus one people agree with you, that makes your decision morally good. Because to be honest, I've never understood why anybody thinks a piece of paper means they're married. And I'm not, you know, just saying that to homosexual couples. I'm saying that to heterosexual couples. As I say in every marriage ceremony that I perform, and I've done probably a dozen or so now, I can't marry people. God does that. I'm just there as a representative saying some stuff. And it's important. I, I think that ceremony is good, and I think it's good to, in a community of witnesses, especially if it's done in a church, um, not that it has to be or anything, just saying if you are doing it in a church and you have your church family there, that is a community that can hold you accountable. But at the end of the day, the only person that it should matter to you whether or not your, your marriage is okay is you, your spouse, and your God, and by extension, your church. Now, if you don't have a God or a church, you have to replace that with state, and that's why they fight so hard to get that marriage certificate or get that acknowledgement from the government because it says, we acknowledge that your relationship is okay. I think it's silly to want that regardless of whether you're homosexual or heterosexual, but that really is the, the rationale that they use. And if you think that I'm going too far or that I'm you know, projecting too much onto this, I want to show you some clips of some people on the left basically espousing exactly this view. So this first one is George Bernard Shaw. He was one of the very first members of the Fabian Society. He also happens to be a very famous playwright and was friends with H.G. Wells. He wound up writing Pygmalion, which is the play that My Fair Lady is based off of. So pretty famous guy in history, horrible person. And in fact, he is the first person to have the idea, and he was a fan of Adolf Hitler, by the way. He was the first person to have the idea of gas chambers as a humane way to kill people that were really taking up more resources than they were giving. And if you don't believe me, we actually do have some very early video footage of George Bernard Shaw talking about this from the 1930s. All punishment whatsoever. I don't want to punish anybody. But there are an extraordinary number of people whom I want to kill. Not in any unkind or personal spirit, but it must be evident to all of you, you must all know half a dozen people at least, who are no use in this world, who are more trouble than they are worth. And uh, I think it would be a good thing to uh, make everybody come before a properly appointed board, just as he might come before the income tax commissioners, and say every five years or every seven years, just put him there and say, sir or madam, now will you be kind enough to justify your existence? If you can't justify your existence, if you're not pulling your weight in the social boat, if you're not producing as much as you consume, or perhaps a little more, then uh, clearly uh, we cannot use the big organization of our society uh, for the purpose of keeping you alive, because your life does not benefit us, and it can't be a very much use. 
So there you have it. Your life isn't really worth much to us and it can't really be worth much to you. See, in his mind, all of your value, all of it, 100% of your value is determined on how you are contributing to the collective. Your needs are really completely immaterial to George Bernard Shaw. And this is, he is one of the founders of the Fabian Society, which was the first socialistic society in Europe. So this goes all the way back to their origin, all the way back to the very early stages of Marxism. This is how all of them think, because you are only valuable as a member of society, as a part of the collective. Your life is completely worthless, just in an individual sense. All of your identity, all of your worth, that all comes from your community. You don't mean anything as an individual. And unless you are contributing more to the collective than you were taking, well, then clearly we can't sacrifice anything to keep you alive. That's how these people think. And a lot of them would never articulate it, and they may not even realize it in a sense, but a lot of these arguments that they're making start from that same lie. And by the way, that was a very old socialist back from the 1930s espousing this, but the socialists of today really haven't evolved their arguments very much. Here's Bernie Sanders talking about infrastructure. Infrastructure, of course, we're talking about roads and bridges. Water is a big deal. Water systems, wastewater plants. But we've got to take a broad look at what infrastructure means, human infrastructure for ordinary people. Human infrastructure means housing. You got a half a million people in this country who are homeless. You got 19 million households who are spending 50% of their limited incomes on housing. We need to build housing. When I talk about infrastructure, it means if a worker, mom and dad are going to work, they have the right to know that their kids are in decent childcare. That's infrastructure. Infrastructure is having the best educated workforce in the world. That means all of our kids should have the ability to get a higher education, not leave school deeply in debt. It means. So you'll see there in that clip what Bernie is talking about. Every single thing is predicated on the idea that your value comes from your contribution to society. You're just a part of infrastructure. Now, granted, he is smart enough as a politician to make it sound more palatable than George Bernard Shaw did, but that's exactly what he's talking about. And it really astounded me that that clip didn't make the rounds on media more because what he's saying is people are just bricks in the wall. They're just infrastructure, bricks and mortar. They're just part of the fabric of society. And, and that contribution is why we have to pass this infrastructure bill, because at the end of the day, we just need workers to be able to go out and work, you know, seemingly whether they want to or not. And that's why we have to provide childcare. You can't get bogged down in the responsibilities of taking care of children. So that's why we need to provide that so that you can get out there and work. We need to have housing available to everybody at no charge so that they have a place to go home where they can rest so they can wake up and work more. See, every single thing he says is couched in terms of, well, we need to pay for this because we need to get a big return on it. And the way that we do that is we use people as a resource like a brick and bring them back and get a return on that investment. It's all based on this idea that the needs of the collective are just more important. And by the way, in slightly more philosophical terms, here's Barack Obama in 2008 speaking to Wesleyan University. You can choose to narrow your concerns and live life in a way that tries to keep your stories separate from America's. But I hope you don't. Not because you have an obligation to those who are less fortunate, although I believe you do have that obligation. Not because you have a debt to all those who helped you get to where you are today, although I do believe you have that debt to pay. It's because you have an obligation to yourself. Because our individual salvation depends on collective salvation. Because thinking only about yourself Fulfilling your immediate wants and needs betrays a poverty of ambition. Collective salvation. Yeah, I've read the Bible a lot, and I mean a lot, a lot. I don't remember anything about collective salvation ever showing up in there. It will talk about communities being important. It will talk about a community of faith being something that helps you as an individual 
but it all comes at it from the premise that your individual relationship with God is what's paramount. Even in the old times where we have Israel as a theocracy, and even where it talks about some of the problems that can occur when you have, for example, a government, a corrupt king, for example, in Israel, causing problems, salvation is still something that is talked about in individual terms. Barack Obama is trying to say, no, it's really all about collective salvation. And if you want to be saved as an individual, in other words, if you want to be morally righteous as an individual and you want to experience that salvation, that only happens if you're saved collectively. Yeah, that's nowhere in the Bible. And, you know, it's dumb statements like that that are the reason that people, I think incorrectly, question whether or not Obama was really a Christian. Now, I don't think he's a Christian for other reasons, but the, they would uh, question whether or not this person is a Muslim or not just because a whole bunch of the stuff he's saying sounds like it's not Christian at all. And by the way, not to get off on a tangent here, the Muslim faith is very much centered around collective salvation. They're a tribalist society. And that's one of the core themes of tribalism is you are a tribe as a unit and your value is only seen as what you contribute to the tribe. Now, I've done segments on that before. I'm not going to go off on a tangent because we'd be here for another hour if I was just talking about that. But suffice it to say that that is what Barack Obama was talking about there, that we have this sort of collective salvation that supersedes our individual salvation. The Bible's the opposite of that. Let's talk about that for a second. Let's go ahead and give the biblical rebuttal here. First, it's important to note that this is not a new idea. This is not something that is introduced in the New Testament. I do think individual salvation is more emphasized in the New Testament, but this is something that was true from the very beginning, and we can go all the way back to Genesis to see why. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the livestock, and over the, all the earth, and over every crawling thing that crawls on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So what we have is the origin of mankind. We were created by God in his image. That's the reason we have individual salvation. He didn't create a community. He didn't create a tribe or a group or he didn't create a nation or anything like that. He created a man and then created a woman and then gave the institution of marriage. But he created Adam and Eve both individually and even created Eve based off of her husband. But the point is they were still crafted as individuals and they were both made in God's image. And so because we are image bearers of God, this is where individualism comes from. This is the reason that our salvation and our needs and our wants are determined on the individual basis. It's because God made us that way. It all goes back to our origins. You see, we're not valuable because of what contributions we make to society. We're valuable because of who we are and the fact that we were made by God. That's it. We have intrinsic value. Before we're ever part of a community, before we ever make any contributions, we're part of that truth. We're, we're part of the image bearers of God. And so it's him that gives us our value, not us, not our communities. By the way, this is a very common argument that, for example, white supremacists on the alt-right, like Richard Spencer, have made over and over again for the reason that they are in favor of abortion is because they see literally everything through the lens of how you contribute to your community. It is just a different form of collectivism. And because it's a form of collectivism, and because it emphasizes our relationship with each other, they ignore the idea that we're created in God's image. And I'll say this, I can make tons of philosophical arguments against things like abortion, but every single thing is predicated off the idea that I am a person that is created in God's image and so is everybody else. Like you don't get to just run over an individual and a sacrifice or, or a unfortunate thing that happens to them is not meaningless if it's for the collective good because that's an image bearer of God. And because of that, there's certain things you just don't do. 
That's something that every God-fearer is supposed to believe. And the truth is, just about everybody at some point will pay lip service to this idea, but very few people actually will be able to explain why we have intrinsic value. Like, because we instinctively know this as humans, almost everybody, whether they believe it or not, or whether or not their behavior reflects it or not, will give some kind of lip service to, well, everybody's valuable, everybody's important. But then you'll have, you know, the George Bernard Shaw's or the Bernie Sanders of the world say that all your value really comes from how you contribute to society. So they'll talk out of both sides of their mouth on that, but the point is, everybody kind of intrinsically uh, pays some kind of lip service to that idea, but then they live very differently, and secularists have no rationale for this. So if you ask most, athe most atheists, is everybody important? They'll say, oh yeah, everybody's important. And then you follow that up with, why? There's really not a good answer there. And that's why most of these forms of collectivism have either come from paganism or atheism. One of those two. Because when you take a monotheistic God that created every single individual and cares about everybody out of the picture, you're left with no rationale for why every person is intrinsically important. You don't understand that every single person has a value and a place in God's will. And so because of that, that really is one of the foundational beliefs of people that believe in God, and that leads to other beliefs sometimes in the religious realm, sometimes in the political realm, but the point is, that's what's underneath all of it. And even though I can make tons of arguments against abortion or against redistribution of wealth or, or all kinds of other things, when you boil it all down to its barest essentials, that's what's underneath all of that. And there is no replacement for that from a purely secularist or naturalist worldview. There just isn't. There's no way to explain why a person is intrinsically valued in that worldview. But let's also look at another passage in Psalms 139, verses 13 through 16. For you created my innermost parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you because I am awesomely and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, and skillfully formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my formless substance, and in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. I really love that verse because it's, it's such a beautiful explanation and expounding on the creation process. Because the sort of more deistic idea is that God created Adam and Eve, and then everybody that is created henceforth is just the product of, you know, constantly reproducing. And on some level that is true. But what this psalm really puts at the forefront is saying that God's still involved in that process. It may be that a person is created just because a man and a woman lie together and nature takes its course and, you know, you have pregnancy and then a child. But there's a spiritual aspect to that, that God is actually there forming each person. Now, part of that is because there are natural processes he put in place through nature, and as the creator of nature, he is also responsible for that. But this is far more intimate. He's saying with each individual person, God crafts them in the womb. And so the reason that, that is so important is because when you craft something, that's not something you intend to throw away. That's not something that's worthless. Like if you're a potter and you want to make a pot, that pot has a purpose. You have some idea in your head already what I'm going to use it for. It may just be something you use for decoration. It may be something that isn't fancy at all, but it's functional and you need it. Whatever it is, you don't make something unless you have a reason for it. You don't just make a useless thing. You don't make something that's disposable. And so if God makes each and every one of us, then we have value because of that. And if he crafts us, he has some idea of what he wants our life to be. And so no person just spends that level of attention on something that they believe is easily disposable or replaceable. Do you know that in the Bible, 
you are actually prohibited from making an altar to God on bricks. This is something that is in the Torah. You are not permitted to sacrifice anything to God if the altar is made on bricks. Why? It has to be made of stone. Well, what's the difference? The animal gets burned either way. God's going to get that sacrifice, so what does it matter? It's symbolic. You see, people are like stones. God makes those. And they're all different. And it takes work to fit them all together. When you see like a stone wall or something, like that takes a lot of work and a lot of forethought. And there's a, a person that is working the stones that has to find a certain stone to make it fit this way. You don't do that with bricks. Bricks are bricks. They're all the same. They're uniform. And if you lose a brick, you just replace it with another brick. But that's not how God views people. And so if you're going to worship him on an altar, that altar has to be made of stone because it's symbolic about how God wants worship to be. It's supposed to be something that individuals do, and they do it as a group. But he wants them to retain their individuality. And he doesn't see any of us as disposable. You know, if you're somebody that is working on something with a rock, then you see a rock and you set it aside to save it for a particular position, and you can't find that rock later, that's a problem because you have to figure out another rock that's kind of shaped similarly. With a brick, you don't do that. Every brick's the same. You lose a brick, you replace it with another one. It's just that simple. And so it is important that God has that because it is instructive to us about how he wants worship to be and how he sees us as individuals. Let's also look at Ezekiel 18, verses 14 through 18. Now behold, he has fathered a son, who saw all his father's sins which he committed, but he has seen them and does not do likewise. He does not eat at the mountain shrines or raise his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel. He has not defiled his neighbor's wife, nor oppressed anyone, nor retained a pledge, nor committed robbery. Instead, he gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with clothing. He keeps his hand from the poor, does not take any kind of interest on loans, but executes my ordinances and walks in my statues, statutes and walks in my statutes. He will not die for his father's guilt. He will certainly live. As for his father, because he practiced extortion, robbed his brother, and did what was not good among his people, behold, he will die for his guilt. So you notice in that verse, one of the things that is being talked about by the prophet Ezekiel is that the son is doing what I ask. The father is not. The son is not to be held guilty for his father's sins. In the ancient world, this is something that was not done. If your father did something terrible and then died or whatever and couldn't pay for his sins, you know who they took that out on? His family. That is part of tribalism. Uh, in fact, you don't even necessarily have to take it out on the family. A lot of ancient tribes, for example, like let's say the leader of a tribe, a chief, killed the slave girl of a person in an opposing tribe. You know how they would handle that? They would kill a slave girl, not the person who murdered her. They would kill a slave girl from the other tribe. Why? Because a person's value came from what they contributed to their tribe. So because a tribe was injured by losing a slave girl, they would harm the other tribe in retribution by sacrificing another slave girl. In their mind, that's what was justice. Because it was all about that, and you could transfer guilt. It wasn't really so much about finding justice for the person who did wrong. It was about finding retribution and making the people that were wronged feel better. And so this is what he was talking about. This happened a lot in the ancient world. That if they weren't able to take out a, a punishment on the person who actually did it, they would take it out on their family. God says, uh-uh, no. Not in Israel. A son shall not pay for his father's sins. And the reverse is also true. A father should not pay for his son's sins. Each person is judged individually because that's how God sees us. And by the way, this idea is repeated often in Scripture. Uh, they talk about it when they're entering Cana. Nobody under the age of 20 that didn't, they weren't involved in the rebellion, 
those people were allowed to enter Canaan. Everybody that was guilty of trying to leave over a certain age, they weren't. That happens in Numbers 32, 11. Uh, the man that is born blind. The disciples of Jesus ask, Lord, why was this person born blind? And Jesus is like, because he's blind. He's like, well, is it for the sins of his father? And Jesus is like, no, it was done so that I can heal him of his blindness. See, that was a common idea in the ancient world. They believed that if there was something wrong with you, that some kind of retribution had taken place on the divine level because your, your father or your mother did something wrong. And Jesus is saying, no, you don't punish people for something they didn't do. That's not how this works. And so this idea is repeated over and over again. And again, it's, it's just recycled paganism. This is tribalistic paganism, just like we saw in the ancient world. The, the collective good is what's ultimately what you focus on. But, but God is saying here in these passages, no, it's all about the individual. And we'll look at one more to kind of solidify this idea that comes from the Apostle Paul. This is from Galatians 3, 26 and 27. For you are all sons and daughters of God through your faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, in that passage, now is Paul saying that those designations are completely meaningless? No. Paul, in several of his letters, talks about different roles for men and women. He will address certain passages specifically to Jews and Greeks just because they have different needs, because they have different spiritual backgrounds. But he's saying, as far as it comes to the kingdom, there's no such thing as a second-class citizen. You're all made in God's image. God wants all of you. Christ died for all of you. Ergo, you're all equal in God's eyes. Doesn't mean we don't have certain roles to play. Doesn't mean that there aren't some things that some people are going to be better at than others. But what it does mean very definitively is we are all equally valuable to God. And you'll notice that that spanned all of the major divisions that would have been cropping up in the church in their day. Jew and Greek, bond or slave, male, female. He's saying all of you are valuable to God. and You don't treat anybody like they're a less than when they're in God's kingdom. And so that really... Because it crosses all of those boundaries, it means there's really only one distinction that God actually cares about. There's the saved and the lost. That's the only major dis dis distinction that God is very concerned with. Are you part of his family or not part of his family? Are you saved by the blood of the lamb or not saved by the blood of the lamb? That's the distinction God cares about. The others are immaterial to him. And ultimately, what is important here is that Christ is the answer. You want to live in a society that emphasizes the individual and holds that up? I talked about earlier how you need monotheism for that, a universal God that created everybody and loves everybody and is equally important to God because they're made in his image. But if you want those distinctions to not matter all that much, if you want a world with true equality, Christ is the only way to do that. Even under the old system, even under the Old Testament, there were certain distinctions between Jews and Greeks, and that partition is done away with, with Christ. All are equal under his sight. And now let's go on to the constitutional rebuttal. Now this one's not going to take long because it's pretty plainly pointed out. So let's go ahead and look at that. This first one, I'm pretty sure you're going to recognize it. It's from the Declaration of Independence, which of course is not part of the Constitution, but it was never intended to be separated from the Constitution. It's been used in countless Supreme Court cases as a justification. They can use that as legal precedent in the Supreme Court and go back to it. One of the first times this was done was in the Amistad case with John Quincy Adams representing the Amistad slaves. And Joseph Story, one of our foremost legal scholars overseeing that case. And so the Declaration of Independence, though not part of the Constitution, is what the people who signed the Constitution into law felt about. It's our mission statement. And so that's why it's important to bring it in here. So from the Declaration of Independence. When in the course of human events, 
It becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them to another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. As I said, you can make a secular, secular argument for equality and why it's better and why it's more pragmatic and all of those things, but underneath it all, when you boil it down to its bare bones essentials, you have to ask, why is everybody valuable? And the only answer is because of God. The founders got that. And that's why they talked about it here. They, they talk about the separate and equal station. Why do we have an equal station with the King of England? Because we're both people made in his image. We are made by God. And they say that it is nature's law and nature's God that gives us that. And so they understood this perfectly. Why do we have the authority to ignore King George and make our own nation? Because we're people just like he is. And we're going to give you a, a long laundry list of all the reasons why we've been trying to get your attention and you've refused to listen to us. And we're going to start our own nation now. However, the reason that we're able to engage in that activity is because we are also image bearers of the one true God. That was their basis for everything in the Declaration of Independence. And it actually continues on a little bit later in the same document. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They're created equal. Which means that the reason that they are equal goes back to their creation. And who did the creation? The creator. And so again, this is just another indication that everything, all of our rights, all of the ideas that the founders had, they came from that origin point. Now, they didn't include that in the Constitution because they wanted it to be universal, but all the ideas have their origin in the idea that God created mankind. And without that, you don't have anything. Why are the states represented in the Senate? Why are they represented as entities and not just masses? Because sheer democracy is not what our founders wanted. They understood as an institution the states had rights too. And individuals within those states also had rights. It wasn't just strict majority rule. Why is it that the courts are supposed to be out of the bureau uh, supposed to be on the outside of the bureaucracy? when it comes to the way that our federal government works. Now, I know that they haven't always been, and sometimes they have been way too chummy with it. But the point is, the idea was always they were going to be separate. Why? So they can judge individuals in such a way that doesn't favor the government. That was the original intent. The government doesn't have an automatic buy or an assumption of being right when stacked up against the desires of the individual. If the government represents the collective and the individual represents himself, they wanted that judgment to be on even playing field. They didn't want the, the government to be able to run roughshod over the rights of an individual. Why is it that all of our rights, given in the Bill of Rights, protect the individual, not the government? You see, our Bill of Rights actually acts as a shackle on the government. It says, this is a long list of things the government is not allowed to do. We don't have a list of things people are not allowed to do. Now we have those in, for example, criminal law, even though that's largely handled by the states and not the Fed. But they saw the most important laws in the land had to be the ones saying, government, you're not allowed to do this. Collective, you were not allowed to impose your will on an individual because they understood the tyranny of the majority. And they understood that a democracy could be just as tyrannical on an individual and in running over his rights as a monarch or a tyrant of any other kind. You see, ultimately, uh, we have to look at the words and the ideas of our founders to understand this. Let's go ahead and look, for example, at Thomas Jefferson. So this is from his first inaugural address in 1801. A wise and frugal government, which shall restrain the men from injuring one another, shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement, and shall not take from the mouth of the labor the bread it has earned. In other words, this idea that you're just going to take something from it, somebody else because it's good for the community, it's good for the collective, mm -mm. no, government isn't allowed to do that. 
you are going to keep people from killing one another, essentially, or injuring one another in some way. And then you're going to leave them to their own devices. That is all government is allowed to do. That's the kind of government that Thomas Jefferson envisioned. And then he went on to say that you're not going to take bread, you know, which could be represented as money. You're not going to be redistributing wealth. You're not going to be making things equitable. You don't take bread out of the mouth of a laborer when he's earned it. That's his. So the assumption is to favor individual rights over the collective, and Jefferson makes that abundantly clear. So let's go ahead and look at what James Madison, the guy who actually wrote the Constitution, said. So this is from Federalist 10 in 1787. James Madison says, From this view on the subject, it may be concluded that a pure democracy, by which I mean a society consisting of a small number of citizens who assemble and administer the government in person, can admit no cure for the mischiefs of a faction. A common passion or interest will, in almost every case, be felt by a majority of the whole. A communication and concert result from the form of government itself, and there is nothing to check the inducements to sacrifice the weaker party or an obnoxious individual. Hence, it is that such democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. So this is James Madison actually making both cases. He's saying, first of all, the reason you don't support democracy, the reason you don't have the collective coming together to decide what's going on is because it hurts the individual and it usurps their rights. But he says, but it, what's even worse is it doesn't take long and the democracy itself falls apart. So he's actually making both cases, that putting the collective above the individual not only hurts the individual, but eventually it also hurts the collective on top of that. And of course, James Madison is right about that. But the point in all of that is, the founders understood that whatever the collective wanted to do was far less important than protecting the individual's rights. Because they had this idea that man could govern himself. That a man really needed only his God to justify him and that he could live to the best of his ability and worship his God in whatever way he saw fit. And that was a better government that was going to wind up working out far better for everybody than the kind of system that they tried to propel onto others, uh, that they tried to center around some kind of central power whether it was a monarch or a democracy or anything else, really. You see, ultimately, leftism just treats humans as cogs. The same and interchangeable. And the only reason a cog is valuable is because of the part that it plays in a machine. A cog, by itself, does nothing. And because of that, it's not valuable until you use it in a machine. By itself, it's completely worthless. And that really is how the left views individual people. God is the exact opposite. He treats people as a precious art that he crafted himself. It's his workmanship, which he has made to do good works. And because of that, he values the individual and says that we have to value the individual as well. I mean, look at Matthew 25. When all of the people that are standing there ask Jesus, you know, what is it that is going to get us into heaven? How are we going to be saved? He says, when you looked after your brothers, when you did the, your, when you did things of service that I would have done, when you treated other people as valuable image bearers of God, as though you were treating me, that's where salvation comes in. It's when we value the individual that God looks down at us and says, thou good and faithful servant. You see, the founders really did believe that the highest purpose of man was to be able to cultivate that, that relationship between himself and his God and his fellow man as best he saw fit. And they believed that the best way to get that result was to give them the maximum amount of freedom with the smallest amount of government possible. In other words, they wanted the collective to be as little an influence 
on an individual's daily life as humanly possible. It was the opposite of this lie that the collective needs are more important than the individual. Stay the course, friends. Thank you for listening to the Tactics Podcast. Tactics is a production of Not Ashamed Media. Any opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of our business partners or sponsors. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. Video production by Jackson Dean. Broadcast studio provided by Faulkner University. Location studio provided by Delreda Church of Christ. Copyright 2021.